Good morning. Happy Father's Day. And a warm welcome to all of us who have gathered here at St. Matthew's in person, and also a warm welcome to those who gather with us in spirit via live stream. I'm very glad that we could be together today on what is not a lovely summer morning, uh, but is a muggy, hot summer morning that includes rain. And we, we do still love rain, don't we? <laughs> Although I have to admit it's paling for me a little bit after these last uh, couple of hours. I'm very glad that we're able to join together in this season of creation, the season of growth, the season of new life, joining together in worship and in praise. Are there announcements that we ought to hear together in community? Then let us quiet ourselves and prepare ourselves for worship. Will you join with me in the italics at the bottom of each screen of our opening prayer? Let us pray. We gather, O oh God, on this land we share with the Mi'kmaq Nation under treaties of peace and friendship. And we thank you for your love and strength abiding with us and giving us hope and courage. Guide us in your goodness and grace, we pray, as we offer ourselves and our gifts to your work of love and justice, peace and reconciliation, comfort and care. Bless to us this time together in your presence. Amen. Will you join with me in singing our opening hymn this morning? Number 820 is Make a Joyful Noise. And the lyrics will be on the screen, but it's also in the hymn book at number 820. Please be seated. <coughs> Good 
reading this morning is taken from Paul's letter to the church in Rome, reading at the 12th chapter and beginning at verse 9. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zest, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints, extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. The word of God. Thanks be to God.
Let us pray. God of grace, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There are times when I wonder what the Christian church might have been like, how things might have unfolded, not only immediately after Jesus' death and resurrection as the disciples began spreading the gospel, but for the decades and decades and centuries thereafter, what the Christian church might have been like how things might have unfolded if it hadn't been for the Apostle Paul. Or more properly, I should say, if it hadn't been for the sacralizing in canon, I mean the inclusion in what we now call the New Testament, of letters that Paul wrote and that were later written in his name to the early churches in Thessalonica, in Corinth, in Ephesus, in Colossae, and of course in Rome, like the letter that we heard passage from this morning. I wonder sometimes how things might have unfolded in the Christian church if all we had to go on was the Gospels. No letters of Paul. If the only words we'd soaked in sacredness as articulating the mind and will and way of Jesus were what we were told Jesus said and what were shown Jesus did in the Gospels. Because I think things would have been very, very different. Not only in the church, but in the Western culture it built as a whole, in which just a very few verses written by the Apostle Paul have done an awful lot of heavy lifting. Not the verses we've just heard, of course, that Deneen just read for us from Romans, but a handful of others about women, about sexuality, about slavery, about submission to authority and governance, about what and who is okay and what and who is very much not. The real irony, it seems to me, is that I think the Apostle Paul would have been horrified that within a very few centuries after his death, not only the very specific letters that he wrote under very specific circumstances to very specific churches, but also the later circulars that were written in his name to the Mediterranean churches more generally, I think Paul would have been horrified that they were accorded by the early church fathers the status of holy scripture, equivalent to the gospels, comparably sacred, and at least as authoritative and directive of the Christian life as the gospels, if not actually more so. If not actually more so, simply because unlike the gospels, the point of which is kind of storytelling, the lifting up of Jesus' life and words and deeds, the letters are way more straightforward in terms of being directive. Their actual point, the letters, is setting out norms and standards, rules and regulations. They're not like the Gospels, stories of Jesus' life that reveal what God is like. They're not like the Gospels that contain Jesus' words, of course, but that also show us his will and his way in how he was in his life and ministry. The letters of Paul aren't like the Gospels because the Gospels require discernment. They require the sifting of stories, teachings and events and anecdotes so that they'll reveal Jesus' way. The letters of Paul aren't like the Gospels because the Gospels take work, but the letters are easy. Their very nature is directive. They're Paul institutionalizing, regularizing, 
what Jesus simply lived. And that straightforwardness has meant that in terms of shaping how the church unfolded once they were named as sacred by the early church fathers in the third and fourth centuries and included in our Bible, the letters of Paul have actually carried far more weight and far more authority in shaping how the church unfolded than the Gospels themselves. And more to the point, and frankly, I don't think the Apostle Paul would disagree with me when I say this, they've also carried far more weight and far more authority in shaping how the church unfolded than they should have. And part of the reason I think that is because of the passage that we just heard from one of those letters, from Paul's letter to the church in Rome, written to prepare them for his upcoming visit, a beautiful passage that Janine just read for us. Because in this passage, what we catch a glimpse of is Paul at his purest. Paul, in his very first contact with the church in Rome, literally just introducing himself to them. Paul pulling it all back, pulling back all the institutionalizing, pulling back all the theological explanations, the norms and standards, the rules and regulations, the advice and suggestions and attention to specific details. Paul pulling all of it back into what is essentially a pure distillation of simply what he considers, has discerned, is the heart of it all, how to follow the way of Jesus. Because Paul knows perfectly well that's what actually matters. Paul didn't know he was writing scripture. He was just writing a letter to introduce himself to the church in Rome. And in it, he distills perfectly what he knows actually matters. Everything the early Christians could learn and discern and find revealed in the stories that were already being collected and retold as they were shaped into what we call our Gospels about how Jesus was in his life and ministry and how Jesus wants us to be. It's a lovely list of how to follow the way of Jesus, Romans chapter 12, starting at verse 9. Just 25 easy steps, which admittedly is quite a lot of easy steps. But the point is that this passage is Paul kind of doing all the work for us, mining all those collected stories, considering all the moments and interactions and conversations that Jesus had with other people in his time on earth. How did he behave? What did he say? How did he choose or not choose to be? This is Paul doing all the work in Romans 12 of distilling the heart of the how to follow the way of Jesus message. And here's what it all amounts to. Let your love be genuine. Hold fast to the good and reject the wrong. Love one another. Be honorable, fiercely, faithfully, passionate for justice. Serve God. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Be generous. Welcome the stranger. Love even those who harm you. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another as equals, with humility, with nobility, and in peace. It's the whole of the way of Jesus distilled by Paul out of the gospel stories. And it's hard not to imagine what things might have been like if that had been what shaped how the church and the Christian life eventually unfolded. 
if as Christians we looked only at the life and words and way of Jesus as our guide. And if as a church together it had only been the life and words and way of Jesus that shaped our community ethos. Because among other things, we'd have found ourselves without a single New Testament Bible verse that we could use to oppress or harm or silence or reject whole swathes of humanity because none of those verses come from Jesus, not one of them. I think that matters. And frankly, I think the Apostle Paul would think that matters because he's the one who at the heart of his letter to the Romans, introducing himself before he visits, drops in this clear and perfect distillation of the way of Jesus as purely itself, as revealed in Jesus. Unadapted, unmitigated, unshaped by Paul's entirely separate and hard and essential work of institutionalizing, of trying to make the church doable and sustainable in its context on the ground, in the face of a whole bunch of different and specific and variable pressures and realities and combinations of people and issues in a very specific culture, it was hard work. It was hard for him to do. But Paul never knew that what he would write would get turned into sacred scripture, laden with divine authority, quoted as directive for all time and eternity. He was just institutionalizing in real time, on the ground, day by day, in the moment. I think that has to matter. It's true that I've never yet met someone inclined to weaponize verses from Paul regarding who should keep silent in church or who rules whom in the hierarchy of power and submission or who might possibly be an abomination. I've never met anyone inclined to weaponize those verses who's been in the least impressed or shaken in their convictions when I've asked them to show me where Jesus said those things. I mean, they can't, because they didn't. But for many churches and many Christians and for many, many centuries, that simply hasn't mattered and doesn't matter. There's been too long a comfort generally with a Christianness that easily and unashamedly when presented with Jesus versus Paul, will easily and unashamedly default every time to the clarity of a verse or two from Paul rather than words or example or the way of Jesus as revealed in the Gospels. Every time, whether it's keeping women silent or whoever doesn't work shouldn't eat or know your place and stay there or here's who you get to hate and reject. For too long and for too many Christians, when it's Jesus versus Paul, Paul always wins every time. But it's the way of Jesus that as Christians we're invited into. It's the way of Jesus that we're called to follow. It's how Jesus was how he welcomed, how he loved. That's the example that's meant to guide us. It's the fact that he made a point of pushing back on every single social norm about who didn't matter and who could be ignored or rejected or cast out. It's the fact that he said again and again and again, instead, you on the edges, you they call unclean, you the woman, the leper, the Samaritan, the tax collector, you I love and I welcome as whole and beloved and a child of God. 
It's Jesus we're meant to be following, God being our helper on the way, not Paul. Jesus, who imagined that when he commanded and embodied wide and generous and fulsome love and welcome and well-being for all God's children and literally said nothing about rejecting anyone for who they are, it's Jesus who imagined that when he commanded and embodied these, that we'd understand he meant it, not be looking for ways to avoid it. Imagine what the church as Christian community for these past 2,000 years might have been like if all we had was the Gospels. The irony is that we can actually draw nearer that Christian community how we imagine it might have unfolded if it hadn't been for Paul just by reading a little bit of Paul, just by leaning in to his perfect distillation in Romans 12, starting at 9, his perfect distillation of the way revealed in all the collected stories that became those Gospels in one little passage of the letter to the Romans. 25 easy steps, beginning with love and ending with peace. Because the way that Paul himself wants us to follow is the way of Jesus. Thanks be to God, our help and our guide. Amen. Will you join with me in singing? Great is thy faithfulness. You'll find it in the hymnary at number 288, but the lyrics will be on the screen.
Amen. Please be seated. As we lift our prayers before God this day, we remember also the work of the United Church of Canada in Guatemala, particularly in communities that have been affected by the pollution and upheaval associated with Canadian mining. This is the work of our church. We pray for the people of Guatemala as we pray together. God of grace, we thank you for all you have shown us about nobility and honor, humility and love. We thank you for all who have been for us fathers, guides, protectors. We thank you, O oh God, for the gift of your son Jesus, for his life and his way and his example. We thank you for those who under duress discerned in his way a pattern for living. We ask, O oh God, that you guide us in following his way. Here this day, we ask our prayers for those who are in trouble, for those who are afraid. We pray for the people of Dauphin, Brandon, Winnipeg, Carberry, for families grieving great loss, for first responders. We pray for firefighters in Western Canada and for our neighbors rebuilding, filled with anxiety about the future. We pray for all who are living with fear and anxiety, for all who are ill, for all who are dealing with great stress in home life or work life. We pray, O oh God, for our children as their school year comes to an end, for fruitful and happy and fulfilling summers. We pray for all who are hungry for all who are thirsty. We pray for our earth and its fragility. Help us to protect its fragile systems, to learn to cherish it for those who will follow us. Make us mindful, O oh God, in our living of the needs of others. Help us to be generous. Help us to forgive. Help us to act with wisdom and to be patient with one another. These and all our prayers we ask, O oh God, in the name of your Son, Jesus, our guide and our hope, who taught us when we gathered together to pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is number 420 in Voices United, Go to the World. It is new words to newish words to a very old and familiar church tune. 
Will you join with me in singing? Now let us go forth into this new day, into this new week, to seek justice and to love kindness and to travel humbly together in God's path. And let us go forth knowing that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of God's Holy Spirit rest within us and lift us up this day and always. Amen. <laughs>